We're back after a hiatus and a prolonged absence and a protracted uh, running away. I don't know. What's another word for not being around for a long time? I had shit happen to me, people. <laughs> they cut me open again and stuff flew out. I So, you know. And then you popped open. And then I, yeah, and I, and I have all the equipment, so it's a pain in the ass for everybody. But... We're, we're, we're here. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't die again. I managed to somehow cheat death. I, I don't know how I you're cheat. The, uh, you're the uh, video gaming equivalent of Chuck Norris. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or uh, Jon Snow, you know. They, <laughs> oh, spoilers. Game of Thrones spoilers. Yeah. No, we're going to get letters. Yeah. <laughs> from both of them. Yeah. From- <laughs> so... Uh, but in our absence, a Coleco Chameleon has finally gone to yeah. sleep. We, there was no, no, there's no never to bring up. There's no new news on Coleco Chameleon. It's amazing. However, the Dreamcade replay seems to have risen from the ashes of that phoenix. Uh, it's it's an interesting system, and it honestly, to me, it looks like a more well thought out uh, piece of. Hardware from a company that has been in the arcade business before. All this hardware that will exist. Yeah, what I is, mean, what is this called like, again? It's called the Dreamcade Replay Universal Vintage Gaming Console. Essentially, what it is is it's a microcomputer. I'm I'm not certain if it's running on a Raspberry Pi, but it's something very similar to that. A Linux-based, uh, pretty powerful mini computer, and it's going to come in three flavors. Says their Kickstarter. One of them is... Lime. Yes. Blue raspberry. Oh, I did see that. Ecto cooler. Uh, Oh, we have ecto cooler now. uh, Hey, it's (laughs) it's because it's popular. You know, it's it's, it's retro. Um, Three flavors. One is a mini console that looks startlingly like one of those at games uh, plug and plays, like the, um, the Atari flashbacks. It mm-hmm. looks ex- almost exactly like an Atari flashback, and inside it, it's got a microcomputer. And then the second version looks like an X-Arcade joystick with a trackball and and a bat, you know, style controller. We don't uh, have those know, anymore. We have, we have ball tops now. Yeah. Bat style Street Fighter controller. Yeah. Um, and it's got a nice retro wood grain rainbow look to it, but it's a one-player uh, module. It's it's like a big X Arcade one player unit, and then the third flavor is a tabletop bar top arcade mm. with the, with a touch screen. So it's got it's got a PC touch screen in it that will you know allow you to have your own little bar top arcade. Now this company Dream Arcades Incorporated they they were already in the business of prefab arcade machines on demand. You know, those ones you see on the internet, maybe like $3,000, something for your man cave, select from a myriad of stickers for the side of it. You know, you could have them custom, so it says like, Steve's Awesome Arcade. I was going to get one of those years ago. I thought, <laughs> thought different, but my plan was to get the like super deluxe one that would have been like the stand-up cabinet. And it would have had like you know would have been like this thing behind us, uh, where it's, yeah, it's a big platform. Like, and they had it. They had this deluxe one where it was this gigantic like X arcade thing for four players. Yep. Oh, shit. four sets of joysticks. So you could do buttons. Gauntlet. You could do Ninja Turtles. You yes. can do and four sets of joysticks, two trackballs, WrestleFest. What? Two spinners. And Why would you need two trackballs? In case you oh, oh, wait, wait. One track ball. Okay. I, tax. For two trackballs, you could, yes, you could do, do, you could do a tax. You can do the trackball version of track and field, <laughs> which is the one where both players get their skin pinched in the side of the trackball so hard yeah. that they all come out with, like, big blood blisters that the, need to be lanced. Grid, if wait, I'm not multiple, done. Multiple players. I'm, that's never been successfully emulated oh, yeah, as a grid. Uh, no. I'm not done. 
Then also, there was in the ability uh, that I mentioned dual light guns. There were dual light guns, and there was the ability to somehow, I don't know, if you open the thing up or something, in some way, you could attach like a, a modern uh, uh, force feedback driving wheel for driving games. <laughs> so pretty much everything. And, I think this was just a fever dream. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> oh, this isn't a real thing. And... That- you could also have an, uh, analog, uh, some kind of digital flight stick that you could put on there. This was, I'm telling you, this was all advertised. But does it know why kids love Cinnamon Toast Crunch? <laughs> I guess not. But this was all advertised for like 10 grand or something like that. Jeez. But this was the Christ. deluxe of the deluxe of the deluxe, and I've never seen it again. Anyone well, off. For good reason. It's How big would that, that thing be? Gigantic. Yeah. Yeah. They stopped offering it because somebody actually said, hey, I want one. Here's 10 grand. And they were like, oh. Probably to make it. <laughs> yeah. But they were also they made this, one and they were like that. We're never doing that again. <laughs> they were also offering a encapsulated driving sit down cabinet, a generic one. You know what the funny thing about that is? With the force feedback wheel and blah blah blah. Ten thousand dollars for oh, that, even less. or less, somewhere. Let's say around the ballpark of ten thousand, you still would not be able to play Spy Hunter in any kind of successful fashion. <laughs> you, well, paper boy. yeah, uh, paper boy, you can you can do with a joystick, but you don't you don't get the handlebar. the sensation Tron's of the handlebar. Kind of got a weak- oh, Tron's a pain in the yeah. ass, man. On Mame, even with an X arcade with a with a trackball. Well, I've seen psychopaths. They have they do this weird triangle thing with their things, where one side's like this. Trackball and bullshit like that. You flip it. One side's a flight stick. You flip it again, and it's just Tron. Right. Just Tron. I think uh, I've seen that on um, Frank and Cade's, like the website that has like the worst Mame machines ever. Like people who, <laughs> who made like Mame cabinets out of plywood and just like dropped a TV set in the middle, and like you can see uh, like all the wires coming at out. Those. It makes me feel good about uh, myself. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel bad about life. <laughs> so. Anyway, these these Dream Arcade people, they've been in the business f- actually selling and producing hardware for much longer than Mike Kennedy ever did in his entire life. So, A, it's a, it's a little bit more of a legitimate Kickstarter in that they have produced actual prototype hardware that you can you can see in action if you go to the Kickstarter. Uh, and B, um, what's what's really Kind of the thing about this that that I think is going to be problematic if it's successful is that they they seem to have an operating system in these in these uh, Dreamcade replays where they've they've clearly licensed some software from Atari. You know they've got that kind of Atari 100 pack uh, kind of software that that's in everything that you can get in on iOS and Android, where it's like. I don't know, 20 or 30 of their arcade games and then like 80, 2600 games. But then the rest of the stuff that it does, it, it emulates Atari 2600, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, just like every other Raspberry Pi type computer out there that has all of those systems emulated. And then it goes, it, this these things talk to the internet and they go on the internet and they can download ROMs and they have an entire graphic interface where you can type in like I want you know uh, Super Mario RPG and it comes up in a list and you click on it and it's obviously not you know they're not going to be hosting these ROMs it's obviously going to be doing some kind of web that's the thing I'm confused about that there's no way they can be hosting these ROMs on their own sites anywhere now even though Websites like Cool Roms and Emu Paradise have existed for over a decade and somehow managed to avoid Nintendo shutting them down over and over again. Uh, I, I don't think a commercial venture could host Roms in in something that they're selling, like these little arcade cabinets for six hundred dollars. I'm wondering if it works like maybe like a like Torrents. Like it is it does. User to user. Oh yeah, it's, 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 some it's, type of. If somebody has Super Mario World. And you type in Super Mario World. You're you're downloading it from them. Quite yeah. possibly, like peer to peer or 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 torrents or or it's going to just go search the web and it's going to aggregate every link that it can find. Like it's smart enough to be able to recognize a link for a game on something like EmuParadise.com or CoolRoms or those sites that have been out there for ages and ages. 
that have all the MAME sets and whatnot, it's going to be able to just find those and point you to them. And maybe those links won't work sometimes. Like, you go to download one of them, and it's like, oh, I can't get that game for you. I just you. don't understand the... See, this is similar to other endeavors where these these things are made. And I look at it, and I say, okay, fine. Like, they got the hardware, they got the idea. But I'm thinking, like, well, who's it for? Because if you think about it, if you're talking these old old consoles, especially something like the 2600 or, like, the ColecoVision... Finding a full set is not hard, and it doesn't. T- it These things come with uh, like practically a full set of ColecoVision games. Mm-hmm. They've they've got that ColecoVision license that was obviously out there waiting for the co- the Coleco Chameleon to happen. <laughs> like whoever owns all of that IP, like bundled that up and, and got their lawyers and got it ready for for to be able to be licensed and put on things. So these these Dreamcades have an SD card with a ColecoVision sticker on them that's like, you know, I, I don't have a picture of it well, I, on this, but well, so... What I'm saying is, though, what, kind of, what, what niche is this trying to fill that doesn't already exist with something like, even like an Ouya or something like that? Or, Probably you know. the people that I get in the store all the time that, like, they're like, oh, I emulated for years, but I'm so scared of downloading from those websites like Cool ROMs because they have all these things that pop up that say download now, and I click yeah. them, and then my computer's bricked. That's that's a part of it. Um, I I if you guys all ten of you have been listening to this podcast since the beginning, you know I was the evangelist of the Ouya. I still use mine from time to time. I I think it was it kind of was the gateway to where we are now with these microcomputers doing all these little emulators and being a small form factor and and easy to use for the novice for the p- person who doesn't know how to go online on like a Windows or a Mac PC and get all these emulators. I think there is, there's a market out there for the people who would buy a flashback that would download more games automatically. Yeah, I think the whole thing with this is like, the way you would advertise it to an idiot would be, it's Netflix, but with Super Nintendo games. Mm, yep. And and I tried to sell Ouya to people like that. Which, of course, is illegal. Yes. Yeah, that's the next Definitely. Thing. <laughs> this is what, this, and this is our concern. Now, I tried to, you know, in my time, I, you know, tried to make everybody buy an Ouya. And I was like, it's so much easier in a lot of ways than, you know, emulating on your PC because they have this marketplace and all the stuff up there is reliable and it's really easy to just put the ROMs on, a, on an SD card or a, a USB stick and stick them in the back of the Ouya. But I met, everybody I met that I tried to, you know, give that spiel to was like, oh, that still sounds way too complicated for me. So these are, their niches, the people who need that one button, like, click. All those people, they've been trained to be scared of the word download because yeah. download equals virus to them. Yeah. Stream is fine because they've streamed Netflix, they've streamed their um, uh, Amazon Prime. That's never hurt them before, but downloads have hurt them. So, um, can I uh, give my two cents of why there is no market for that? Of course. Yeah. Well, the, the pledge is eighty-five thousand on Kickstarter. There's eleven days to go, and they're up to twenty-six and change. I thought, and I... Oh, really? Shit. Yeah, not yeah. going to happen. Yeah, unless they got some billionaire. Well, well they want, what, this 85, is... 85 grand? This yeah, is yeah. my thought. 85,000 is though? really modest. But can I say why yeah. it's not going to happen? Here's why. So if, um, if you want the Dream Arcade Replay Classic. So this is the... The little flashback. The little one that looks like the, uh, the like a Atari, like the Sears Telegames <laughs> version of the Atari yes. 2600. The silver band on the on the front. <laughs> With the little uh, controller, remote controller. The regular price is three ninety nine. Kickstarter price two eighty nine. Three and four hundred dollars. But yes, no, but well, whatever. But Kickstarter two eighty nine. I know that part of the Kickstarter has to go to fund and blah blah blah. But I'm not paying two eighty nine for that. So they have no lawyers and no one in marketing. So, hold on. Now, the Dreamcade Replay Mobile, this is the one that looks like... A bar top. The, yeah, the, like the uh, the iCade and et cetera. Mm-hmm. It has one stick, uh, six buttons, Jesus. three other buttons, something like that. Regular price, seven ninety nine. dollars Kickstarter price, five ninety nine. That's on that. That is on That's par with those barcades, better. those those oh, bar top yeah, things better. you get on eBay. That's typically what they ask for them, and they they don't have 
all the emulators in them. They usually have the 60-in-1 yeah. JAMA vertical board. Mm-hmm. And then finally, the uh, Dreamcade Replay Arcade Edition, which is the big, the you know, the one... X-Arcade. X-Arcade <laughs> type of setup with the one joystick, buttons, and the trackball. Um, but it actually includes... The, it has to include the little Atari 2600 thing, because that's how it, what runs it. Mm-hmm. You're just getting this big controller thing. Regular price, five ninety nine. Kickstarter price, three ninety nine. That seems to be the best value. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> giant <laughs> joystick. Because it's a giant Bluetooth joystick, which I would assume would work with practically anything, or USB. But, you know, there's still... I hope. <laughs> they're, they're definitely pricey. But if you look at the Kickstarter page... Oh, here's the. They, they list all these home consoles from you know years ago. Oh, it's and, the specs. Yeah, and then their controllers. Like this is what they're advertising. Nothing really about arcade. I mean, this is it looks <laughs> cool. I'm not gonna you know, I'm not gonna blast it. And I think it also will. <laughs> We're looking at the ColecoVision SD card. <laughs> and laughing. What's that from? That's if you keep scrolling down. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, I'm telling you, it's... They'll give you a ColecoVision-branded SD card. That's, that's worth channel. the Kickstarter. I'm giving them the extra 50000 they need tonight just for that SD card. Yeah, and it, it's going to come prepackaged with, like I said, those Atari games. Um, and and a, <sighs> Those prices are hefty. Like Those prices really seem like when you contact one of these guys and it's like I want a bar top from my man cave and it's going to have all my favorite stuff on it. They're like, alright, $700. They're like, deal. That's no, fine. No, they're never $700. They're much more expensive. <laughs> they're, they're in the thousands. They're those things, if you go to those websites, they're always in the thousands. They're they're for, you know, people who pull down enough money where a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks is like... You but know. I even feel like seven th- 700 or 600 is a lot of money for, like, the people well, here's the other question. that I'm thinking would do this. <clears throat> sure. Let's forget about the consoles that are emulated on there, because we've discussed ad nauseum that you can you can emulate these consoles on about 50 different devices. Yep. You can get a used Dewey exactly. out for, like, yeah, 75 bucks. Ouya. I couldn't They're, give the Ouya away. I think I still can. Use a PSP. I'll take it. Yeah, modded, <laughs> modded original Xbox. Your phone, your PC, your tablet, whatever. There's a million ways to emulate these consoles. My question is, you're selling this arcade-like setup. How far in advance can you go on the arcade emulation? Does it run everything that's on MAME? I don't know. Well, the thing is a lot of... It's it runs, got, let's say, does it run Street Fighter 2? It's got specs. Yeah, it's it's going to run Street Fighter 2. It's, you know, the question is, is it going to run Marvel versus Capcom 2? Yeah. Which needs imagine. a more complex emulator than MAME. Um, MAME, even in its newer versions, has issues with games like that. Yeah, uh, anything like past the 90s is when it starts getting a little iffy. You got something that's fine. And- this thing's got some decent specs for a mini computer. It's it's an x86, two gig gigahertz processor, four gigs of RAM, a 64 gig drive built in, Bluetooth. It's got an SD slot, built in Wi-Fi, USB 3.0, Ethernet, 1080p output. Uh, it's got audio out, and it has built in DB9, Atari, and Sega Genesis controller ports, and HDMI out. Again. I I agree with Greg. I don't think this thing is going to succeed just looking at where it is right now. However, I do believe with a modest Kickstarter asking price of under $100,000, I think they probably already have investors in the pocket that even if the Kickstarter fails, they'll just sell they'll just manufacture and sell these things. I don't I don't think that there's any way that 80 something thousand dollars would have ever been enough for this to have been fully realized and happen, you know, in a manufacturing capacity, in in a in a prototyping, capa- in anything. Like, there's already big money put into this, and I'm sure there's already big money, Which, as it should be. That's yeah. how Kickstarter should ideally right. is supposed to work. It's supposed to be you're supposed to supplement Kickstarter with eighty five. It's, it's not like I want two million dollars to. What could Mike Kennedy produce with eighty five grand? Uh, maybe the, the ColecoVision magazine, the ColecoVision SD card. I, I will say, 
just an update. I did get the eleventh issue of the retro. <laughs> <laughs> the I got an email yeah, about that. I got one an email. One more. You're gonna get a paper digital press like magazine. <laughs> it's gonna say one retro and market. That's by my investment. One more. And that's so. it. Yeah, but I mean What was the the eleventh issue? Was it any good? We're sorry it was like a Zelda a million pages. retrospective yeah. and it seemed like there was less just cut and paste from other past publications than there had been in the It's like a ransom one. note like cut out of, like, all the articles are cut out from like we have, Garden magazine. We have issue twelve. <laughs> yeah, if you'd like to see it <laughs> send one million Coleco chameleon <laughs> box tops to this address. It still wasn't that good. It wasn't very good. Yeah. So, is there any word on what's going to happen to that? Was there a letter from the editor in the back of the magazine, like, like a fire sale or like apology? Any nothing? Well, I mean, they're trying to package all of their past issues and into like this big commemorative nonsense that you can buy. And the only people that would buy those are the people who already have those eleven issues. <laughs> they should have a Kickstarter, and instead it should be like the Cleveland Chameleon one, but it's crossed out, and it says commemorative issues. <laughs> it's all eleven issues just with a piece of duct tape <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> and a post-it on the bottom that says issue 12. It's the only way you're going to get 12. Uh, yeah. So, take a look at this uh, thing. I... I We'll report back if it's successful with within the next podcast. It has eleven days left. Who knows? Maybe it could get um you know in, in the eleventh hour it could. There is another Kickstarter. I just thought of. I, it may be over by the time we put this up, but uh, uh, somebody is starting a new. I don't even think this is a print issue magazine, but it's a it's a Sega themed magazine called oh. Mega Visions. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like the old Sega Visions. A subscription that that was the Nintendo Power competitor. We actually just got a, like half the issues of Sega Vision traded in. I got the last that issue. many. How many issues were there? It was only out uh, for like 24, a year or two. 25. Mm-hmm. So. I think it rolled into like I think the original format of it was like a very thin, uh, like the early Nintendo oh, Fun yeah, Club all style. Very thin. Even and if- then it bulked up towards the end where they had a lot of advertisements. That was around the. Say the the Sonic Two the era. The last issue advertises the 32x. Yeah, oh. and there's also like, it's all over the front. It advertises that you could enter to win a um, Virtual Fighter cabinet. Nice. So uh, yeah, so uh, Al Nielsen, the marketer uh, extraordinaire from Sega from back in those days, and also Tom Kalinske, who was the Heavily featured CEO of Sega. They will be involved in some sense. And uh, mm. our past uh, friend, uh, uh, interviewee Blake J. Harris, is also going to come on board oh, as nice. a uh, contributor. So. And, yeah, Kalinsky was heavily featured in uh, Console Wars. So. That actually. Yeah. Uh, so I did back it. Good. I backed it for like yeah, whatever, 30 bucks just for the subscription, I think. What do they want? Do you know? I imagine something reasonable if they got that many people behind 30 it. Thirty bucks for a subscription. Oh, for the the grand total, I have to look it up here. That'd be good. Cause yeah, we don't have our computer today. Yeah, because <clears throat> it's a piece of shit. <laughs> <clears throat> to be completely, if anybody wants to send the Digital Press podcast <laughs> a new computer or uh, or like an <laughs> iPad Air, you know, we'll um, we'll mention you on the air. Right. Well, so they got there's seven days to go as of this uh, taping, and they needed thirteen thousand. They've got eight thousand two. How many more days? Thirteen or seven days? Oh, hey, they're in Mount Holly, New Jersey. That's yeah. a shame because that sounds like they've got a good. Uh, that sounds like a good product. You know what I mean? That sounds like they've got an, enough of the right names involved. Well, damn it! Look what Mike Kennedy has done to the market for, for video <laughs> game magazines. He's scared. He's scared off all the prospective uh, investors. Well, even that uh, thing we were just talking about before—they're not going to make it out. He just killed Kickstarter. <laughs> Kickstarter's wow. never going to work anymore. It's dead. <laughs> Nothing will ever be successful. I on think Kickstarter. the issue that they might have—no pun—with with this. Uh, Project is if it's really Sega themed. I don't know. I mean, you're talking about a dead company. Well, there's no one to stop them. I mean, Sega could step in and be like, "We don't want you to do that." But oh, no, hell no. I mean, yeah, exactly. Well, Sega loves. My point is their IP being out there. What, what are you like? What are you doing? 
Like, what's the material? You're just going to... Isn't it going to be rehashed? Yeah, exactly. yeah we're going to go from the, there. It'll yeah. be like Retro Magazine. Let's just yeah. talk about how great Sega was. And I can tell you from working here, there's enough of those people that would buy that magazine. I could put that on that shelf and I'd sell it day one. Most of them would be, like, from ages 5 and to And unlike 15. Retro, you may actually be allowed to sell it here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to be a print magazine. That's my guess. Or they would need even more money. Mm. Interesting. Um, oh. But that, I, I, that, that's my guess. I Print is dead. Yeah, I would, you know, I'd, I'd like an EPUB version. That's all I ever want of anything is an EPUB version. <laughs> I mean, I, my bookshelf is literally, like, full. I don't have, I don't have any room for any more books or magazines. I mean, I EPUB. buy the, the Hardcore Gaming 101 books. Not uh, all of them. They're I, great. I bought a bunch of them. Kurt? Kurt Collada. Collada. He's a... Uh, Shout out, Kurt. Yeah, he... His stuff is good because, first of all, mo- almost all of it is past um, writing that most of the mostly he's done, but others too on his website. So um, he, you know, he's not having to go out and commission new things to be written. It's already done. He's putting it into a package, into a book. It's nicely uh, laid out and everything, everything like that. And they're thin, so you can buy, you know, his whole lineup and only come out about here. Well, they're thin except for his the PC. Japanese. No, the PC adventure gaming one oh, yeah. is like, well, that was it's a, a phone book. It's it's amazing. <laughs> so comprehensive. Well, he also put out the Japanese game developer book, ah, which was that. some guy in England. So he went over there and did all these interviews. And now there's a volume. I, I, are from, I was listening to our Brooklyn Bites Featuring Leon and Stephanie, our, our friends, and they were talking about the uh, the volume two that I guess Leon ordered, or maybe he had it. Um, but again, it seemed like I looked that up on the internet, and it seems like more of the same. Where it was just this guy did these interviews, he got them translated in English, and he just dumped them <laughs> into a book, no editing. Just <laughs> Which is fine, you know, look, it, it, you're doing interviews, it's fine in a sense because it's just question, answer, question, answer, but, you know, 500 pages and now another volume with 400 pages of question, answer, question, answer. He's talking to some very important people in, in the Japanese uh, gaming community from the 1980s, which you never hear from. You don't, never hear from these people. Uh, so that's good, but again, it's question, answer, question, <laughs> answer. <laughs> It's kind of dull. So, anything else to say about... Um, yeah. God, I feel like there was another... Um, print. Another Kickstarter? I would, <laughs> that is something yeah. I would like to say. That The truth of the matter is, I'm getting a little... A, a little annoyed at the the consistency that every... It seems like every month there's another, like, two or three Kickstarter projects that are all trying to, like, just be the next big thing. And it, it feels like it's um, it, it's it feels like a like a prospecting, you know. That's exactly it, what it is. You know, it's, though. It's, 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 it's like prospecting, and it, it just at some point, at some point, I feel like the bubble's gonna burst. You know, something something really terrible is gonna happen, and I'm I'm, I'm worried about it well, happening. Well, in the words, I'm gone. <laughs> I've got a terrible feeling. Yeah. Well, what I think is what's gonna happen going is to eventually die. you're gonna get a series of like really high profile projects that are gonna fund. And somebody's going to abscond with all the money, and it's going to be a whole, whole mess. In the words of the late great Macho Man Randy Savage, the cream rises to the top, <laughs> to the top. So with Kickstarter, you know, you have there are millions of projects on Kickstarter that we literally don't know about mm-hmm. because they're not out there like publicizing in places that we would ever see them. Well, and so the podcast would be a lot longer, yeah, if we knew about those. And well, you have to go on there and just it's like. Troll like troll through hundreds of things to find like oh someone's you know kickstarting a new game that's like Bionic Commando like I might be interested in that you know you have to look for what it. I mean, it's, what, what, it's hard. What, what happened to like doing ordinary business? You know you get a you get a small business loan you produce something and then you sell well, it. Yeah, but the industry so is I mean, whatever happened to right. The in, who's look gonna at, give you the loan? The state of the industry is. Yeah, you know, has banking industry is destroyed. Deviated into two, you know, forked into two harsh realities. You have the triple A multi, in some cases, billion dollar games like you know your Grand Theft Autos and your Call of Duties, and then you've got your indie projects, and there's almost no in between anymore. Mm-hmm. There used to be like a much 
broader scope or, or there's like a, ra- a rainbow of fruit flavors. flavors. Yeah, there was a, there was a game production middle class, and those a lot of those I think came out of Japan, and they were like utility production houses. Like a lot of them were in, in the UK. Yeah, or, yeah. or like oh, they yeah. you know they were just cranking out games nonstop, and you know they were of median quality, not not. They weren't classics, so they weren't unmemorable. They're games that were fun and, you know, could fill that shelf space. And now there's just no room anymore for that that middle ground. The, the indie developer is almost an aesthetic. Mm-hmm. It is an aesthetic. It, it's, it's funny. It's the argument of cartridge or, or physical media versus digital media. And I've always been one that argued that some people have said, look, if you go to digital medium... You can go onto iOS and just download a you know forty games for ninety nine cents each or something like that. So that's a good thing. The bad thing about that is, in the old days, if you actually put a cartridge game out there, you would sell you know even unless it was really horrible, you would sell X amount and you would make money that way because it was the only way somebody could get it was physically. But I, I felt like the markup on it would make you money. I think now these indie games and everything are too cheap mm-hmm. that you're you're net, you're not really making anything back, and so there's you know there's a small contingent of them that get huge amounts of downloads, and then everybody else is kind of you know missing because there is there's also no marketing arm behind it. You can't go into a Toys R Us and look at a you know a, 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 a yeah. wall of. 60 uh, Sega Genesis games and start looking at the you know the the placards that they had there and looking at those the game cards that doesn't exist that's why one of the reasons I think that Steam has been so successful with indie developers is they they do a great job of aggregating and promoting to front page through you know the user upvoting or reviewing or like the things moving around the green light program that's kind of the modern day Toys R Us video game aisle that we have now. It's either that or, you know, you go to GameStop and you look at the wall or you have one of their sales associates say like, oh, these five games are coming out next month. Do you want to pre-order for $5? This like, is what I'm being paid to tell you about. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, and I, and I don't mean to single out this project because I'm not singling out this project. Because, I mean, this is actually one of the, one of the lower... Levels that Wh- they're which one are we talking about? Sega Visions or, or the Dream oh, no, Arcade? The Dream Arcade. Or the Dream Arcade. Okay. <laughs> we Sega Visions. We, we so talked about so many Kickstarter yeah. projects yeah. in one well, breath. Exactly. Is this what about I, the potato salad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, like, you have all of these. Again, this is part of my beef with the with the indie gaming environment. Is that in, it's not instead of doing just instead of just doing business, producing something that is within with, with instead of producing something that is realistic for their means and then selling it they're asking the public to indemnify them like we don't want to take the financial risk Mm. we want you to take the financial risk we want to take however a million dollars and we want to divvy it out five dollars here five dollars here something that you're willing to lose that this guy's willing to lose five dollars that guy's willing to lose five dollars and then so we don't have we don't have to put ourselves on the line as opposed to using Kickstarter as effectively saying listen I'm going to be taking financial risk but I just need you know, say, you know, 20 grand, 30 grand just to get my foot in the door. Mm-hmm. You know? In the beginning, a lot of, I mean, now, that was very appealing doing that. But now a lot of games are more, a lot of any companies are more or less saying, no, listen, we want you to fund the entire project. In the beginning of Kickstarter, the promise of being a part, like playing a part in, in, you know, not really being an investor, but but giving your money to something, knowing that it was going directly into a project and not, you know, having to wait for it to be funded through typical standard business means and wait for it to, the game to go through its development cycle and come out. Like, that was incredibly appealing to a lot of gamers. I mean, enough so that, like, look at projects like Mighty Number no. 9 and Shovel Knight. Both Is that finally out yet? It's yeah. out. Uh, Apparently it sucks. <laughs> I have, I have, I've heard. I have yeah, opinion. I have an opinion on it. If we want to talk about Mighty Number no. Nine really quickly, but look at look at the rapid success of those, where like people saw 
a video game hero, an icon of theirs, of Inafune, the guy who created Mega Man, going out on his own and making a game that's going to be exactly like Mega Man, and you can pay for it now, you'll get it later, and you'll you'll be in the thank you on the in the instruction manual. And people were like, "Holy shit!" And it got gets funded six million dollars in in a matter of minutes. But now, here we are, years later, one or two years later, the fruits of those la- of those actions. Have have come to fruition, and people are seeing rotten fruit on the vine. They're not they're not happy with how things play out, and they're getting. You're starting to see the beginnings of the the video game Kickstarter bubble. It's, it's harder and harder to fund things because when the products finally come out, if they're not if they're not a home run, if they're not a friggin' grand slam, people have. A, now, Mighty Number no. Nine got railed by critics mm-hmm. who were not happy with it and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that A the people who all invested big money in that were Mega Man super fans like people who played every single game knew them backwards and forwards and and could you know recite every single robot boss man every hard man and fireman and rock man and whatever from every Mega Man game and they felt like you know they they this wasn't the second coming of Mega Man it was it was average at best but I think what I'm saying though is that I think those people were taking advantage of you here you got a guy KG Inafune who is who was in the industry who is a name who presumably could have maybe I'm not going to say easily but could have had some avenue to fu- to get the project funded by investors that would have say a you know, a profit sharing mm-hmm. part, an actual backer, as opposed to going to the. Well, there were there, there were people that that was a part of Mighty Number no. Nine. The Kickstarter was a part of the funding. Then there was additional funding during production that occurred through like a secondary campaign that was outside of Kickstarter. And then there were also capital investors, right? But it was also the and it's always it's almost always the way. The Kickstarter for that game was part of the marketing for it, even though it yeah. hadn't come out yet yeah. or hadn't even been done. So, just in a like sense, you can't you can't look at it and say those the 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 developers for that game should not have done the Kickstarter. They're well within their rights to do it, and you would have to say they were successful in what they were trying to do with it. Now, the fact that the game stunk has <laughs> nothing really to do with Kickstarter, but... For the record, I didn't think it stunk. Well, I, mean, that's like, you know, I thought it was just like an average Mega Man I X type game. I, I own it. I've, I've put a couple of serious hours into it, and I think it's, it's perfectly serviceable. I don't I don't have any problems with it, I, but I'm also not a Mega Man super fan. I what I would say, so. sorry, what I would say though is what you have to think about. What are you getting in the Kickstarter? If you're paying, I would I, I probably paid fifteen dollars and whatever the, the amount to get you like the Steam version. Mm-hmm. So I paid for the game. I didn't really pay anything more than that. So I, I really can't say, oh my god, it's shit. But you, I, that's it. I just paid for the game. Now, if you put in, let's say, I don't know, sixty bucks, and you got some trinket or some other you know swag that came with it, fine. I mean, that's what you wanted. You wanted this limited whatever it is. Now, if you put in. Five hundred dollars, and I don't know what they gave for you, but if you if they gave you something you feel you felt was worth five hundred dollars, then shut up. If it wasn't, and you feel like, geez, I got something worth you know a hundred bucks, and the other four hundred basically went in their pocket to develop this game, eh, maybe you have a beef. But that's the question. I think think that if that's the avenue they were going, though, then what's the problem with just a traditional pre order scheme? You know, listen, you know. Fifty dollars, you get the game when it comes out, and however many. And, and, well, and, and that's we'll, essentially we'll what it is. Go into production if we hit a certain threshold. Kickstarter is yeah. the vehicle for that pre-order. That's except I'm not sure about they that. They just exist as that there's, service. There's, there's numbers lower than a reward that will get you the game. Five dollars, ten dollars. Well, yeah, but but those are just people who it. want to be patrons of the arts. They want yeah. to, you know. It's like I, I also am. Yeah, I have a, 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 a Patreon account where I give money to a couple different groups on the internet that, that produce content like similar to us. They go on the internet and they talk and they, they make funny. And, and they've never asked for money before. And then Patreon 
came around and said, if if you love these artists, give them a little bit of money every month. That's that's the way it was in Renaissance times. You know, like people who did paintings and portraitures and stuff, they didn't they didn't sell them. They they would they would have financiers that would just give them a stipend every month to to just keep working. Just keep working and keep working and keep producing well, also, and keep producing. They, there was also some influence Sure. That they they had on well you know I, I this what you're painting here the Sistine Chapel exactly yeah, this, and, and this has got to look like the the uncle and this has got to look like the other guy and and as a pa- and as a patron you you have a voice you you can talk you oftentimes talk directly to the artists through those Patreon accounts or or get to know them or well you know, yeah but I mean what I'm saying is that that's that's a different kind of situation than this mass Kickstarter yeah, thing when you're basically I, just sure but Kickstarter offers that in you know if you just want to give a dollar for a thank you or a five dollar for a thank you, you know, if people are c- c- crying that they're getting taken advantage of over that, there's certainly an argument to be had that people can get taken advantage of with video game kickstarters where the product the, that is produced is subpar. But hey, look at the past thirty or forty years of video game retail. Look at all the games that have come out that were produced through traditional funding and development cycles, and we wind up with. I, I don't know what the hell's some of the wor- we, the ETs of, well, of you know the is, world. It's everything still it's sitting playing. on the shelf after I the think weekend. I think it's what's happening is it's playing on people's addiction. It's it's saying like you know I think at some point you have to say listen no we're you know we're not gonna we're not just we're not gonna support you you're, we're not gonna indemnify you against taking risks. You're gonna produce a game that we want to buy and we'll buy it. If it's not good, we're not gonna right, buy but it. Right, but the. And, the and, you know, we're we're go, we're going to be consumers. That's it. That's an arm's length transaction. We're, you're not our friend. You're a biz, you're a business partner. To an extent, I'll give an example. With, with it failed, but the Toe Jam and Earl game that they were going to try and do that Greg Johnson, the original Toe Jam and Earl guy, was going to do. Um, for instance, and there was there was other examples too. The Mutant League guys wanted to do a game and all that. Yeah. These are people who they may have you know they have jobs now and in other areas. A lot of them aren't even in gaming at all anymore. So they want to come back and they want to bring these IPs back and do something new. And there's fans that want to see it. Um, you know, the the problem those people have is they can't go out and say. Okay, we're going to make a game on our own time with our own money that we don't have either of, by the way, uh, and then you know, decide whether or not you want to buy it. Now they can't do that, so they have to go to Kickstarter and say, "Listen, we need seventy-five grand to do all this stuff because uh, basically it's either we get the seventy-five grand to cover our asses so that you know we can actually do this, or we don't do it." And that's that's really how most of these seem to me. The Mighty Number no. Nine is the exception; it's not the rule. I mean, that was a case where that guy, yes, he could have gotten backers because mm-hmm. of who he was, but most people cannot do that. Well, I mean, yes, you know, Shovel Knight was a uh, the, the guy who was that kickstarted. That was kickstarted yeah. for a a. I don't want to say a paltry amount, but a much smaller amount. It wasn't a six million dollar Kickstarter. It was over a hundred thousand. Um, he wrote a, a blog where he breaks down the 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 pre the cost of development and what he got on Kickstarter. And it, they wound up also having to spend so much more than they got in the Kickstarter to to finish that game, get money. Through loans, uh, they they had to all like not get a paycheck for the entire product, right. almost the entire production of the game until it was out there in the market. So it's like it's not the math. The the this is why Hollywood works because the studio systems have figured out how to make a hundred movies every year, and even if they bomb, even if you have a Batman versus Superman, they they have an, enough of a spread with the rest of the movies coming out of their studio that they know what guaranteed successes will make them, you know, enough money with one opening weekend to cover all the losses. Right, but I, I one of the books I, I, I read, in fact, I read it as I was on the plane going to the, uh, talk about it, the National Video Game Museum in, uh, in Frisco, Texas, was I have a book that was written by Edward Burns, the director, actor, and he talks about all these different projects he's done over his career where... In some cases, he had like a million, three million dollar budget, and it was a disaster. And in other cases, he's been very successful, including recently, 
making projects for twenty five thousand, especially after like the red cameras came out, this, the huge digital where they were really really good quality. So just as an example, where he says, "Look, I can go out and I know all the tricks of the trade, and I can make this movie in two weeks with thirty grand." And I could put it out there on the independent circuit and on Netflix and all that, and I could probably make you know make it back easily that money in tenfold. So that's a, that's a, a movie example, but it's an example nonetheless. Where and I, I think maybe the the point that Mike's trying to make is, and maybe this is why it works for the Shovel Knight guys because they're young, they're fresh, they're new, and they know how to do this on an indie level. They say, "Look, I can make this game. I know how to make this game cheap. I've done it before." And then you know somebody else can sell it or whatever. But even if it doesn't sell, I'm not going to get die over it. Right. You know, I'm not going to be bankrupt. Whereas a lot of these Kickstarters from these these guys had been in the business before, and this was one of the things we that was talked about with the retro VGS when they had that guy Carlson involved. He wanted to do all these things exactly the way it was done hardware-wise right. in 1993. It's insane because it would cost 20 times more than it should have, but that's that's what I think the older generation, they don't know how to do it on the cheap because they never did right. it on the cheap. I've, they worked for a company. I agree. I, and, I, and I had argued with some people online about Shovel Knight versus Mighty Number no. 9 that Inafune, if you think about it, he spent probably 30 years in the studio system. Yeah. He was a big name. And that's he, what he did. He was a big wig, but he worked primarily for companies like Sega that, I mean, you're an employee. You're going in. There's money coming in, paying your paychecks, you know, for you to produce all this stuff or, or Capcom or whatever, whoever else, Capcom primarily. Whatever else he's producing, there's he's got bosses. He's got, there's boards of investors. That stuff always existed. Now, here he is going out on his own and people are shaming him and he's taking the, the whole brunt for all, whatever fiascos happen with delays, Lacking quality, anything with Mighty Number no. Nine. He's he's the typical Japanese falling on his sword. Uh, you know, he's like, I, I take full responsibility for this, and it kind of sucks because I think he he came from a business world and he's out on his own now, and he's probably he probably learned a lot in those all those years about how to do it. And maybe this first venture, it didn't work out. Maybe the next game, they'll they'll know. I, I think what what I'm trying to say is though is that. The quality of the the end product is, is not the, the beef that I have. Even Mighty Number no. Nine could have been an excellent game. I haven't played it. I would still have the same criticism based on the fact that, like, a guy like Keiji Inafune, that's not what Kickstarter's for. No, I agree. You're you know? right. He, he should he have a guy like that in that position. That's, that's like Peter he, Jackson going out like, he, I want exactly. to make another Hobbit movie. Exactly. He, <laughs> he, should, have, <laughs> he should have come out with a playable deck, done nothing, said nothing, made not a peep come out with a playable demo knowing that hey this is the playable demo you want to get involved with Kickstarter blah 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 it's going to come out in another five or six months it's, it's a, a rational period of time not two or three or four years because it had to be done from scratch mm -hmm. that's the mistake he made so let's uh, oh, well. see how um, but you liked the game you thought it was okay I think it's I think it's perfectly fine I haven't finished it uh, I'm interested in continuing to play it there was nothing it's it's really weird because I read it's all this short because if it's too short I could see their complaint. I don't think so. I mean, I'm an ex I'm a big Mega Man fan. Mega Man, I love Mega Man a typical Mega Man game. If you know the patterns, if you've played through it, you can beat them very quickly. You can go through a Mega Man, a game like Mega Man Two in like thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's if you've played it before. Yeah, if you've played it before, and from what I'm fe feeling from the couple levels that I have completed in Mighty Number no. 9, it feels a lot like Mega Man. The patterns, the robots always come, they're not random, there's nothing random about it. They always come out the same. You, you learn when to duck, when to slide, when to dash, when to jump, when to avoid getting hit, uh, what weapon works against what boss. It's, it's the Mega Man formula. People just had two years for their dreams to percolate, you know, and kind of I think grow beyond what this could have possibly ever been. I I think it, even if it was a much more sophisticated game, it probably still would have taken a lot of flack just for not living up to the, the hopes and dreams of the people who did invest hundreds of dollars and, and, you know, they feel responsible. They feel like they were a part of it in a way that 
can't be satisfied, no matter how good it is. I think it's okay. I also think it's a hell of a deal at retail for 30 bucks. You get if you buy the PS4 version, you get the PS3 and the Vita version. You get you get th- it's essentially ten dollars a game. Yeah, it's a great deal. I mean, you know, I don't know. I think they're these these critics are, are idiots anyway. <laughs> they they've been they've been long. These people have been longing for something like this that they can that a game that they can jump on and criticize the way that they used to like twenty years ago or thirty years ago that hasn't existed. Like, there's not been a game. That is not ridiculous like Call of Duty where they could write every critique in the world, nobody cares. Yep. Um, and like you were saying, and it's not too small where nobody's even going to care about the review. This is the perfect case that they can jump on and they can hammer it. And that's, I think that's what they did. It's a bit of a perfect storm. We'll see what happens with Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night, the, from the, uh, the... Who's the Cas- Castlevania guy? Oh, Who did uh, Symphony of the Night? Uh, Koji Garashi. Yeah, because of this... You know, apparently the playable demo for that is is out, and people li- ha- like it a lot. So, so that game is on the horizon for uh, this year or 2017, early mm. early on. So that we'll see if that learns uh, from the mistakes of Same Mighty Beef. Number Nine. It Same. could be, it could be, it could be as good as Castlevania Symphony of the Night, or it could be a disaster. We might get, and if and I think if that game winds up being disastrous critically. I think that's pretty much going to be it for those kind of like big names going out onto Kickstarter and saying like, "Hey, I'm the guy who created Bionic Commando. You want another Bionic Commando game? I'll make a guy with they a did. with a leg, a Bionic <laughs> leg that, that he, he can shoot his leg out and grab onto stuff. G- give me thirty bucks and you'll get the. G-. I think that'll be the end for yeah. those kind of things. If Bloodstained kind of has the same problems as Mega Man. A lot of Japanese guys are retiring after that if it fails. <laughs> well, they're, you know, most of the guys from that era, I think, oh, right. are, yeah, are. They're old yeah. enough to retire, but yeah. they're still pumping out extra Symphony of the Nights and Mega Mans. Well, nobody well, nobody well, actually retires in Japan. Leaving, no, you just leaving, work until you drop dead on the yeah, job. They're leaving because the industry is all, like, fucked up. They're, yeah. You know, they're, they're not... The console, it's a really, it's a really, really console business there is rough. Really oh yeah, industry. no, Japan, it's really hurt. terrible, terrible yeah. industry. Like people think working. the phone's taking over here in video games. In Japan, it's like, yeah. Well, that that's why I don't want to really get into this, but that's why the the a Nintendo NX, there, you know, it's going to be some kind of a mobile device. It's going to be something that they're hoping to to get in on that. Craze, but probably not. Please, I hope it doesn't have those almond shaped controllers like those those fake out internet things. Oh. Oh. <laughs> those were so <laughs> fucking ugly. Oh my god. Oh, they wow. were so horrendous. All right, we've been talking for almost an hour, so we'll be back with uh, some show and tell, yeah. I think. Greg's got more toys. It's show and tell time on the yeah, Digital yeah, Press right. Podcast. We need a theme song for the show and tell. I got to do like a little <laughs> animated intro with like with like a cartoon of Greg with like bags of stuff. Please don't. <laughs> just dumping it out on the table. <laughs> uh, so what do you got? All right. So the first thing. Uh, well, first of all, I, I'm, there is a Nomad box here. That's fine. Let's let's ignore that for the moment. So this just came out. Uh, this is a. There's a guy in Atari H. His uh, his forum handle was the Saint or Saint or something like that. So he's in England and he decided to make an SD flash card for the Atari Lynx. So he got all my letters and all my prayers and all the, all my letters to Santa for for the past like 25 years. I've been like, yeah. all I want is a Lynx flash card. Where you could put a little SD card in it, and it has a menu system, and the games boot up. That's all I want. Well, that's why he's the saint. He is my he's my lord and savior. So uh, I don't know when he announced this. Maybe two, maybe even three years ago. I don't remember. Um, it's been a while. I've been following along, and he's made you know he's making progress. Whenever in the free time that he had. So at some point he was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to make these, but um, you know they're time consuming to make them uh, individually. So you know, maybe I'll do a run of like 50 or something, and then I'll see if I can come up with some, you know, way a third party can um, mass produce these. So he started investigating with, I guess, with some kind of <coughs> Chinese, uh, you know, PCB chip maker or something. And he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna order like 300. So he was able to do that, and uh, he pretty much sold. He was able to sell them a lot of them uh, right away. I don't know, maybe he had a hundred available. 
initially. And since I've I've kept in contact with him and all, he was like, um, and I was pretty far up the list. Wait a minute, uh, this, well, this is it. So he actually 3D printed this kind of like outline that goes stuck that goes over the the emblem, so it looks like it's embossed, and it works on a micro SD uh, flash card. And then he put this like 3D printed cover on it, so that you can pull it in and out of the links easier. And this is his new company name. It's a Retro HQ. Really, Retro that HQ. hasn't been taken yet. No, no it, <laughs> it was. He bought the domain off somebody. Yeah, I guess he got it cheap. And it's nice. The, the cartridge, uh, as a Lynx fanatic, um, it's not too bulky. It's approximately uh, the dimensions of a st- of a standard Lynx cartridge. Fits in the Game Boy. Uh, Yes. Plastic case. Oh. Yes, if you have a Game Boy dust cover, the, the the clear ones that would come with the Game Boy games, you can you could put a little layer of foam. You can get like a a piece of like arts and crafts foam at the dollar store. That just, that's necessary, but for me, somebody. <laughs> have it that way. So anyway, so I contacted him and I said, um, "Listen, I, I'm definitely in for this thing." And the retail was like, "How much was it?" Hundred? Uh, we paid around a hundred, I yeah. think, plus shipping. Yeah, bad. plus the shipping from the UK. So I said, "Listen, um, I'm into this, but I'd like to get like four of them." And he was cool with it, so I got one. Frankie got one, and uh, Joe got a couple for the museum, I guess. So probably one I, for the museum, one for him. May, uh, Maybe. Well, you know what? No. Basically, the guy said, "Look, there's two different versions. It's the same PCB, but he's like the uh, the Lynx One. You'll never be able to shut that cartridge door with this 3D thing on it. So he just left it detached." Oh, did Joe get both? He's like, "Oh, get me," but he didn't realize it. He's like, "Just get me both." Oh, that sounds like. I Joe. said, "Joe, this is it. It's just the the piece is not glued on." Anyway, yeah. so um, there and there was a uh, another guy in England on Atari Age, a Gadget UK is his name. He developed the. Uh, he's been developing the menu for it, and he did this thing where you can actually take uh, screenshots of each game as like a preview. So we'll show that in the menu. And he actually, the other thing was he made the. Did menu. you install all my all my graphics? I think so. If not, I have my card with me, and you can. I think it's the your, your most recent uh, yes. edition. Well, the funny story is that Greg took it down to Texas and showed it to Joe, and the guy who was building the menu software, where as you scroll through the list of games and you pause on a game for like a second, yeah. uh, an image of an image pops up on the screen, and this guy decided that for each game, the guy who developed it used the title screen for each Lynx game with the game's name and like the you know indicia of when it was produced yeah. and and Joe at the museum was like what the hell did he use the title screens for I want to know what the games look like if I want a screenshot and and the logic wasn't that your complaint also I may have I may have laughed when I saw it but I didn't really think about it much and then Joe reinforced yeah. that so I went ahead and I did I went to Atari age and I collected good screenshots mm-hmm. of all the games so all right. now we have uh, screenshots alright so come forward come come hither so this is my mod in links obviously with the McWill so you should come around I, I actually uh, went ahead and, and spent the money on, yeah. on the screen mod after getting the cartridge myself alright so here here's how it works you just you turn it on and the other thing was in the menu, he updated it so that the font is much brighter. Hmm. It was hard to see before. And yeah. so here's a case where, yeah, you see it come up. So let me go back to the uh, main thing here. So we have it alphabetized. So they have the little retro HQ uh, logo there, which is cool. So you just scroll through, and you can hit the left, right to move up the faster through the menu. And so let's say you pick a letter, say M. Hit the button. And it reads the games that are in there, and then uh, you just uh, scroll down and you pick a game. In this case, Miss Pat. Now the other thing is, long file names right now they haven't done yet. So, yeah. Yeah. and here, here's a case where you can see it if you hold the button, uh, if you hold the cursor on it, it will show uh, Frankie's uh, screenshots. Yeah, that's Marlboro Man. Yes, credit to Atari Age. <laughs> they did make a Marlboro, and there is the Marlboro. Atari Lynx is in the, uh, the, the video, video game, game museum. Yes, I've handled it on, on several <laughs> occasions. And so you hit the button and it's programming. And it loads the games pretty quick within, you know, like 10 seconds or so, which is fine. Um, this is obviously Miss Pac-Man. A, a decent port on Atari Lynx. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe 10 seconds was a little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, SD, SD gaming, you know. And there it is. 
It's back, and it's Depressive. the game. I mean, everything else works on the game as as it would. There it goes. And then you uh, you play the game. Now, unfortunately, you have no choice if you want to switch games. You have to turn off the system and turn it back on. I, I they'll probably never get around that. It's I, I from what I understand. The way that the links, the links multi cart works, um, is that it shorts one of the pins yeah. in the, during the boot up process. So this was actually a very complicated solution yeah. for him to to come up with here. So you know, you go, oh, I, I have to show this game. I'm sorry, this super, version of Super Off Road. <laughs> this is the worst game maybe I've ever played on the links. <laughs> Atari Age actually didn't have a good screenshot. I had to look elsewhere <laughs> for uh, that. I guess I guess they uh, it's it's in the apocrypha of the worst Lynx games, so they they wouldn't even. And it's amazing because it looks the game looks fantastic, but it is abominably slow, and it's also taking forever to load. Well, you know, a watched pot and a watched uh, flash card never never boil. The, a washed pot never boils. Make? A washed pot. Never a washed, boils? washed, washed pot. A washed, Unobserved yeah. pot never boils. So they say. Yeah, the the oh. speed the speed on the loading of some of the games is is. Well, a this load. may be a big game. Yeah, it needs to go through the as we've seen in some modern flash cards. It needs to go through the process of probably erasing what's in the memory and then programming in yeah. what's, what's in the memory. <clears throat> mm. Maybe you broke it. No, I think it eventually does Yeah, float. it will. Okay. Boy. <laughs> so, entertained? Dead, dead Space, Dead Air, uh, <clears throat> on the Digital Press Podcast. I, I think something's wrong then. Okay. Right? It should come up by now. I, I would think so. <clears throat> Try it again. This has happened before where for some reason it... Wraps out. Okay. I wanted to do it before the stupid uh, screenshot came up. <laughs> oh, maybe that's a bug in the uh, in the menu. Oh, once, that it shows it once the screenshot is up. Uh, nah. No, I've seen it before. With uh, other games of Miss Pac-Man loaded like that, fine. I mean, this is fi- oh, there. Oh, we go. There Fifteen we go. seconds. So here we go. Telegames. Super Off-Road. 1993. Incidentally, uh, the Telegames Double Dragon cartridge for Atari Lynx is a very valuable (laughs) game these days. Retailing for about $100. All right, here we go. Oh, what am I doing here? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, just buy some Nitro. Start race. It's zoomed in, unlike the arcade version, which which would show you. This the, this is playing now. This is the game is playing. Wow, that's like five frames a second. <laughs> oh my god! That I is, can't even. Where am I? That is the worst frame rate. Which oh, car am yeah. I? Do the blue car. Oh, thank you. It looks great, but that frame rate is. Uh, yeah, this is unbelievable. Now, by the time you're done by the first race, your batteries have probably died. <laughs> All right, enough of this. Well, you don't play it for the frames. You play it for that music. Right. <laughs> you play it for your love of Ivan Iron Man Stewart. Yes. <laughs> and his super, super off-roading. All right, now, we uh, Frankie briefly talked about his getting his links modded. Yep. Um, I had a, another user on it. I actually sent mine to the uh, the guy in Germany, uh, Marco, who, who originated the McWill stuff. So he did that for me uh, with this and the Game Gear. Uh, but I found somebody in, in Iowa uh, who did it uh, locally, if you will. So uh, yeah. Frankie got the uh, McWill done on his Lynx, too. Uh, he didn't get the VGA or the scanline thing. Yeah, I just got the standard, nice, crisp, co- colorful screen. Now, I, on the other hand, I saw, all right. So I had the uh, a Nomad. This is actually a Sega Nomad that was given to me by a fan of my, uh, my podcast, the Paunch Stevenson Show, many years ago. He gave me a... He's like, I have all this Genesis stuff from when I was a kid. Do you want it? And he shipped it out to me. And one of them was a, a Nomad, like, pristine in the box and everything. 
So that's what's here. I, of course, didn't feel like modding that one. So I was like, oh, let me get one that's in crappy shape. The screen doesn't work, and I'll have that modded. That's what I did. Oh, it still has the um, original factory sticker on this. Right. Well, so what happened was I told them, I said, listen, can you change? You know, they have aftermark. Can oh, you change okay. the screen because it's all scratched. He's like, yeah, no problem. They put so, a glass one? Hmm? They put a glass one or is it just a plastic one? Nah, it's plastic. Yeah. I just haven't taken the sticker off. You won't need to. I'll show you why. Mm-hmm. So the Nomad uh, originally suffers from... You know, same problem that LCD screens had in the 90s. I mean, they just, they wash out. There's no brightness. It, they look terrible. But I always thought, like, compared to my the Lynx and the Game Gear, which would look terrible, like, well, this doesn't look that bad. I mean, I can, Sonic was a little tough because it would wash out when he moved and all. All right, well, so. Now, this is a little, uh, this is a little, uh, Birdie told me that the uh, McWill might be available for the Nomad. But. It hasn't come out yet. There's nothing official. It, it, it might be done. But you know what? I was like, I'm never going to play the Nomad that much. I'm not going to spend $150, $200 again getting that modded. So this was much cheaper. It was like 75 bucks, including the, did all the caps in it, the screen, and the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, screen cover. So now the plugged in. We were going to do a quick demonstration here. I'm going to do Sonic 2. We only have one copy. So first I'm going to show Sonic 2 on this unaltered Nomad. Oof. Right now I have to adjust the brightness. Mike? All right, so this is unaltered. Uh, man, what the hell? Oh, hang on. Let me do something. I brought... This is the... I have a bunch of AC adapters, and there's, there's something wrong with this one. It has like a... Short time. You know, and now it like it makes the screen like like wobbly. Oh, okay. No. Huh. No, I forgot. So let's do it one at a time with this one. Alright, here we go. So as you can see, it's the it's the right one. It's just <laughs> Yeah, no. Just, yeah, some of the Sega wrong with some it. I think my Sega 2 does that occasionally with the AC adapter. So as you can see, it's very cloudy with with this brightness. Um Maybe you can't see it on the screen, but you know, I mean, it's it, it's like playing with like composite video on an LCD TV. You know, as you can see, the Sonic is. Uh, well, let me get in the actual game here. You'll see if Sonic moves, it might be hard on this that screen, but uh, you know, Sonic is a little. The background, especially, you get you really lose the detail. Yeah, and then the char- you know the character gets blurred. Yeah. So it's a little. But this one, I mean, here you look at me. I mean, that one's in. It was in great shape. Yeah. The Nomad itself. Best condition. You should have should have gotten this one modded. No, I, well, <laughs> no, they're both in good shape. But I said I figured. Well, that screen is still in pretty yeah. good shape. So. Yeah. All right, so now we'll try you're, it. You're right. There certainly were worse. I think the Turbo Express Oof. screen was a little bit uh, yeah. blurrier than I, the I Nomad. I test when I recap right. them with blazing lasers, and it's oh. ridiculous. <laughs> there we go. Now, this thing, there's no white at all in it. It's just... I mean, I could even see it from here. The and I, I left I a sticker it on it. You've know. you got to take that off. I know. It's like peeling. It's like picking a scab off. It just feels so good. He also, after he did the caps, he said the speaker was obviously better. Yeah. So I mean, this looks like playing, you know, on an LCD with like SCART, like RGB, basically. You're getting, you're getting like the original colors and everything. Oh wow, the background is super smooth on that. That's great. Getting into the actual game. We were gonna do a side by side comparison, but gonna be tough. Doesn't matter. So, I mean, this, like I said, it's like crystal clear. So, yeah, I mean, it looks really gorgeous. And um, I got to say, when I turned on the Lynx for the first time with the new screen after playing with the flash cart for a week or so without it, it was like night and day. It really, these things really benefit from having their screens modified. Uh, So, let's... 
You got anything else? No, nope, that's uh, it. I have crap. No, I have <laughs> some more crap, but now we're going to have a crap okay. competition. Crap okay, so this Whose is, crap is worse today? This is our crap for the day at Digital Press. There's no real story behind it. It was just traded right before we started doing the podcast. It is a... Um, what color would you call that? Um, taupe? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like um, a, a <laughs> root beer. Light, <laughs> light diarrhea. Yeah, and it's only the back and the top. This is this is the color of your stool when you have pancreatitis. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you shit this color, go to your doctor. Yeah. But see, bottom fine, left, right, front, it's fine. Just the the top and the back, and the back's got even where the cords went. Nice little waterfalls of untouchedness. So, so it's something environmental clearly affected this and, and is evidenced plainly by the protected segments here where the cables hung over uh, and either prevented light or oops, yeah. air or uh, some, something. I'm thinking it was like someone had their TV stand right in front of their window and just Sunlight. shot it from here. I'm usually not a firm believer in the sunlight um, causing the ABS plastic to yellow theory, but, I mean, these these lines here are a, a pretty dead giveaway. It's either that or chemicals just were sprayed. And it's interesting to note that, that the built-in modem is <laughs> obviously made from a different yeah, uh, never grade of plastic. Never yellows. So, this, yeah, this Dreamcast uh, has seen some... <laughs> Seen some days. Yeah. I don't know, better or otherwise. And it still works. It's perfect. It's fine. And this is um, one of the later models. And some people are fine with that. Some people are fine with these uh, off-colored. Oh, messes. someone will buy. Hey, look at it. the look at how white <laughs> the, the interior of that case is. If you can, if you can see it, that's probably the whitest part of the Dreamcast because it it's in the dark all the time. Yeah, I mean, you could take off the line, the line adapter. <laughs> it would be whiter in there probably. Oh, man. I got good at taking these off. There you go. There yep. you go. Yeah, this seen the light of day. This, First time I've seen it since like what, two thousand one, maybe. Yeah. And this is uh, this isn't the, this isn't the broadband adapter, right? Nope. I'm waiting for the day where someone actually trades one in with the broadband adapter attached. We've had maybe mm -hmm. in the past two years five broadband adapters, but all of them people coming in like I have a broadband adapter. I think we found one once um, years before you started working at the store in the basement. Yep, with the broadband adapter attached. Somebody brought it up during an av and showed it to Joe, as they do. Yeah, as as <laughs> I've a, done that. As you found uh, the Donkey Kong banana. Yeah, uh, Joe, I found this downstairs. He's like, oh yeah, just put that back. And I was like, no, it was in the free controller box. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the Donkey Kong sixty four banana N sixty four controller. Which we actually have one in stock currently. Very, oh, very pricey. Nice. Okay, what's your shit? All right, this this is I don't know, this could take the cake. So, before coming here, I was with my friend Rob, uh, Rob D of the uh, formerly of the Porn Stevenson Show. We still do it once in a while, but uh, he's been on this show before. I thought he retired. He has more or less. <laughs> so he was going through this box of crap that he's had for years and years. Uh, every time he moves, I guess he's just holding on to this old junk. It was mostly old, like, DVDs and some VHS and mm -hmm. CDs and stuff like that. Well, apparently, back in the day, he would make recordings off the TV, <laughs> not off the speaker, but audio out, of, like, video game music. Oh. <laughs> NES, whatever. And he would sell them on eBay. <laughs> like on CDRs, and apparently this this was a this was something that worked for him for a while. Like the Godzilla VHS tapes and all that stuff that he got at the comic book store, the flea market. So, well, one of them is kind of giveaway. But how about Contra in a a slim CDR case? Now, look at that. Here's my question: Is it would it have would it have the sound effects of like would he play it a game of Contra with no, the shooting, he had to. or he would just let it let the sound let the music cycle? With table of contents. Because some games of that era, you'd have to find like a spot to like just stand still and not move. No, yeah. I mean, just the the you know the stage select. You know, games that would do it. Some games. Oh, well, Contra doesn't have an yeah. audio test well, I don't know mode. What Contra, you'd have to play through, kill enough things. Oh, and it also has. There. As a bonus, did you get the Adventures of Bayou Billy? Well, Super C, it's Contra, 11 tracks, Super C, Bayou Billy, Russian Attack, and then Jackal. Please tell I'll me. Take place in the please universe. tell me that track one of Bayou Billy is the adventures of Bayou Billy. I don't know because well, that's, that's the first. That's the first thing you hear when you turn on that game. 
All right, now we have uh, apparently Chrono Trigger. I don't know if he did this or somebody else did. Oh, it. that's fancy. Yeah, that no, one's at least fancy. Nice. It's a inkjet printed. It's better than Contra. It's the best of Chrono <laughs> Trigger. Oh, it's not even all of Chrono Trigger. TD- <laughs> well, it can't be. <laughs> Look at that. This is this is a classic here. I think this this story would be so much better if he just held a microphone up. <laughs> <laughs> and That's what I said to him. And then you get, like, in the background, Rob, come down for dinner! Mom! <laughs> so, oh, here is the best. Super Castlevania 4. Doesn't even have a cover. Well, no, this is, like, the master. You the know, master. These, these are the masters. Oh, these are the masters. Oh. So that's, you don't get that. No, these, these are, this is the, the like, the... It's like finding a prototype. I can go on like one of the. the you should forums. sell those on eBay. You make Google or phone. No, send them to uh, the retro, the VG grading thing. Yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll grade them for you. Super Castle. Right. Right. There we go. Ninja <laughs> Gaiden and Tecmo World Wrestling. Hey guys, I just, and Radar. I just, I just got a great idea. Look at that tape. We should send something to VGA grading and try and get the lowest grade possible. Has That's anybody really ever great. tried to do that? Oh, someone idea. asked to. I've got. I've oh got shit! I wish they still had my PlayStation. Threw that shit out though. I wish I still had my PlayStation. Oh, <laughs> you still have the melted PlayStation. Oh, yeah. oh. Let's not send them friends to Christmas present. One thing. That half a game gear. We have to. You heard it here first. Copyright, copyright infringement. If anybody tries to do it, we're gonna we're gonna send something to get VGA graded. We're gonna we're gonna pool our money, our collective allowances for the week, and we're gonna we're gonna get something graded that is in the worst shape we could possibly find. We. We'll get back to you. <laughs> All right, so, finally, is that it? Uh, that's it for your, your our shit. Yeah, that's the show. And what do we have? Uh, so, finally, I have a pamphlet from the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas, which I visited a few weeks ago in person. There it is. Is a fun fact. The original pamphlet for the Video Game History Museum that was uh, used to promote their Kickstarter was designed by my wife. Oh. So, there it is. Now, while I was there, uh, Joe Santulli was on hand, and I had him give a, uh, a, vert- a tour of the museum. So uh, we have uh, footage with that, and about an hour long or something like that. Um, I, th- I thought it came out well, so we'll post that. Yep, that'll be a Digital Press Podcast special, special presentation. Special presentation. Any excuse for me to use that old CBS special presentation music that... From the '80s that you'd, you'd hear before every Charlie Brown Christmas special at, I love that. So that's okay. we we use we use that. All right, that's, that's my cool. favorite. All right, so we'll see you next time. I will try not to have any surgeries in between now <laughs> and the next podcast, and hopefully never again in my life. Bye. Bye.